In the charismatic Episcopal Church, we talk a lot, at least I hope we're talking a lot, about our ministry, our presentation to the gospel should give us a passion for ministering to the least, the lost, and the lonely, because God is seeking the least, the lost, and the lonely. But God is also seeking something else. God is also seeking worshipers. Jesus said to the woman at the well, the hour is coming and now is when what? True worshipers will worship in spirit and truth for what? I'm being a little Pentecostal today. Deacon Ian, help me out for what? Yes, Doc. For such, the Father is seeking. God is seeking worshipers. So I want you to take that thought and the thought from Amos and bring them together that God is seeking true worshipers. True worshipers want to make the kingdom of God a reality on the earth, want to make Jesus visible to the people who can't see him. And we're strengthened when we gather here in this beautiful space and we lift our voices. But if that's all we're doing, we are in danger of finding ourselves in the category of the reading in Amos where God says, I'm not so impressed with your offerings of your fatted calves and your great music. Justice needs to roll down into mercy. So I do, I do have a word this morning at the beginning of the pandemic um, when everything was completely shut down. We went in a space of a week and a half from life as normal. Kathy and I were in California at a meeting of the House of Bishops when the world stopped and we had to get on an airplane and fly home and I was wondering if we're gonna be renting a car and driving from California to New Paltz to get home. But we went through all of that. It was eerie. It was like the Twilight Zone eerie because we got off the airplane at JFK at 10 o'clock at night in our car and drove to New Paltz. And I said, let's just, you know, we have a 24-hour store like you all do. Let's just, I just need to grab some groceries because we were gone for 10 days and we always let the refrigerator go down to nothing when we do that. I knew there was no food in the house at home. I walked in the store and it was like they had moved out. <laughs> you know, it was that there was not a single thing on any shelf in the whole store. And so, um, we had one church mass because in New York we had not been shut down yet, but then everything was shut down. And our response to that at the cathedral was, we're going to have a priest say mass seven days a week. We're going to seven days a week mass, which we're still doing to this day, and which we plan to do forever and ever because of how much of a blessing it's been to us as the priests and leaders of the church, but also for the people of God. And that's our response to the turmoil of the world. Um, the daily mass readings, um, well, it was like a week ago, was going through the book of Ephesians for the first reading and the gospel of Luke for the gospel readings. And the reading on Thursday morning when I was doing Mass a week and a half ago was from Ephesians 6, and the Lord really spoke to me through that passage. And so that's what I'm going to be speaking from this morning. Um, just by the way, um, there was an election this week. Did you know that? Um, I was 99% certain of one thing last Sunday. I was 99% certain that half of the country was going to be really, really upset. And as it turns out, I, I wasn't certain which half it was going to be. In fact, I had no idea which half it was going to be. I did not believe the polls either. Um, 
It doesn't matter which half is unhappy. What matters is God is still on the throne. And our mission still hasn't changed. So, the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, it's the passage that if you've ever done a VBS or Kids for Christ Club, you are familiar with the full armor of God, yes? The reason why we're so familiar with it in children's ministry is what better way to engage kids than give them a plastic sword? Or a helmet or all the cool stuff that you do. And that's great, that's awesome. I'm all about engaging our children and getting them from a young age to get the Word of God deep into them. Uh, where's my daughter? She's still in the room. Oh, she's out teaching the kids. Um, so, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, begins like this. Finally, and before I tell you anything else that it says, I want to focus on the word finally. Finally means, now that you've heard all of that, this is where we're going. So I want to just pause for a second and talk about what's the all of that that gives us the word finally. The book of Ephesians can be outlined and your outline can have three words to form what it's about. Sit, walk, stand. Title of a book written by Watchman Nee about the book of Ephesians. The word sit comes from uh, Ephesians chapter 2, where after a chapter and a half of telling us who we are in Christ, who we are in Christ, that we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. So if you don't grasp that, if, if you don't grasp that, the walk part and the stand part will be meaningless. If your identity as a Christian is not that you have been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms by the grace and the mercy and the love of God, if that doesn't form your identity, the, the rest of it is going to just go over your head. It really is. So if you want to press into something this week, press into Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 and 3, because that's the sit part. The walk part comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. This is Paul's transition from seated in Christ to having a walk worthy of that calling because being seated in Christ is the calling of the people of God. That's what God has called you to. It's the foundation of everything else. Absolutely everything else. So he says, now that you have that, he, I urge you, I beseech you, I urge you, as a prisoner of the Lord, which, by the way, was not a metaphor. When Paul says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, he's saying that because he's sitting in a prison cell as he's writing it. It wasn't a metaphor. To have a walk which is worthy of the calling, the walk, the way you're living your life, should match up to your ontological identity. And chapter 4 and 5 and half of chapter 6 is some pastoral instruction of what that looks like. So then we come to the full armor of God. Finally, sit, walk, we're going to learn how to stand. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, here's a misunderstanding. 
even though Paul used as a metaphor armor, armor was never intended to be the power. And sometimes we can be misleading children by talking about the power of God with a sword and a helmet and a shield. And that's where the word that God gave me comes in. So here's what the Apostle Paul is doing. He was, I'm just grabbing my water from over here. He was not doing this so we could have really cool vacation Bible school. The symbol of power of the Roman Empire was the centurion. The centurion was the visible sign of the power of Caesar. The visible sign of the empire that we belong to, which we don't refer to it as an empire. We refer to it as a related word. We refer to it as a kingdom. The visible sign of the power of the kingdom is that right there, the crucifix. Christ and him crucified is this, the visible sign of the power of God. And Paul is contrasting two symbols of power. One is embodied in a centurion who imposes the will of the king on the people. The other is the crucifix, Christ and him crucified, who reveals, not imposes, who reveals the power of God when it's birthed in your heart. Vastly different kingdoms. In Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, um, is a phrase that I think is so important for every Christian to meditate on, take it in, digest it, let it become part of you. If you have a Bible that has little subheadings that tell you what the next three paragraphs are about, and you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, the little subheading that's in the New King James Version says this, fears for the church. His fear for the church is that they were going to revert to the previous empire, that they were going to go back to the power structure of the world, that they were going to exchange the crucifix for the centurion. Are you starting to get a glimpse of where I'm going with this? And he says to the Galatians, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has put you into a trance? And he's trying to shake them out of it. And he says this. This is um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My little children for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. That's the phrase. That's the one that I'm saying. You ought to read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 about being seated in Christ and the result of taking that in as your ontological, meaning the very substance of your being, the very essence of who you are, is that Christ would be formed in you. That's the goal. Let's go back to Ephesians. So, Paul is the bishop of the church at Ephesus. And he can't make his rounds doing Episcopal visits because he's locked in a prison cell. 
but he can still write to them words of encouragement, words of exhortation, words to lead and guide them. And when he, the, the prison letters, when he wrote the prison letters, he wrote to the church at Corinth. So Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, a common thread. They're all struggling with the same thing. Which kingdom do I really belong to? Which kingdom is forming my worldview? Which symbol of power is it going to be, centurion or crucifix? And he said to the church in Corinth, the weapons of our warfare are what? Not carnal, but mighty in the power of God. That power of God. So he, here's the thing. He's holding up for them a symbol of a centurion. And he's saying, be strong in the Lord and remember that our struggle is not against powers and principalities, Republicans and Democrats, is not our struggle. Our struggle is against the forces of darkness that want to blind the eyes of the people of God. That's what our struggle is. And he takes the symbol of the centurion and he deconstructs it. And really what he's saying is put on the whole armor of God so that you will be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness, not political people. When he said the rulers of darkness, he wasn't talking about Caesar. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, what he really was saying was, instead of an iron breastplate to protect your heart, let righteousness protect your heart. He wasn't repurposing the breastplate to say, oh, that stands for righteousness. That's not what he was doing. What he was saying is if righteousness is guarding your heart, you don't need the armor of Rome. Let's continue. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's going to take you forward in the world is not your shoes. It's the gospel of peace, not of conflict. Of, above all, take the shield of the faith. Take the shield of faith. Saying, you don't need that shield. Faith, believing in God's purpose and destiny of your life is how you are going to prepare. Prepare. And he says, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We don't need swords to advance the gospel. That's what he was saying. So, the symbol of power in our present day and in the past week is not a centurion. It's a politician. And here's what politicians do, both sides, since the beginning. They make laws. When you go and you vote for someone, you're voting for someone who's going to make laws. As a Christian, if you know anything about the new covenant, you should know we're not saved by laws. What they were going back to was in the Greek world, the Roman system, in the Jewish world, it was the temple system. Being saved by the law. How much of the New Testament are the writers of the New Testament saying, 
Don't you know that the law is never going to save you? And as Christians, we can easily be drawn into thinking, we have to save this country by getting people who are going to pass the right laws. We need to recalibrate ourselves, church. God is calling us to reveal the gospel, to change hearts and minds, rather than to legislate what we think the gospel would look like and find a system to impose it on not just our country, but the world. And so when I was reading this at Daily Mass, this thought came to me that we don't have centurions. We don't find power from the army, at least not civilly, not domestically. We find power in politics. And what would the armor of God look like? What would this, what would this metaphor look like? How would you take that idea of we're going to move things forward by the right laws getting passed. How, how would that be reinterpreted as the power of God for the people of God? That's the challenge. That's where we are. We need to pray for healing in our country. We need to be the people who are the ambassadors of the kingdom in and we need to know that the empire, the kingdom that we belong to is the heavenly one. And this building is its embassy. This building is an embassy of the kingdom of God, whose leader is King Jesus, who wasn't elected and who will not be dethroned. We need to pray that our passion for the gospel would persuade people of this very truth, that their hearts and their minds would be persuaded. It, I don't think we're going to live long enough to see this. But when that happens, laws are meaningless. We don't need to have the right politicians to impose the will of the government on people. What we need to pray for, which is why Paul says, pray for the leaders of your country. I've been praying week after week for President Donald Trump. This week I'm beginning, Lord, we pray for President Donald Trump and President-elect Joseph Biden. Why? Because Paul said to do that so it would be well with you. If you're shaking your head, your argument's not with me, it's with the Apostle Paul. Pray that it would be well with you. Pray for them that it would be well with you. So that's the word that the Lord gave me. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. His might is not a super pack of a political party. His might is Christ and him crucified. And that's how I want to be strong. And I fail, believe me, I fail. But God calls me back to this place because that's the process of Christ being formed in you. And may God bless the preaching of his word in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.